Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing university art museums with special guests, Mickey Garcia, director of ASU, Arizona State University Museum of Art, and Julie Rodriguez Widholm, executive director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. So thank you both for joining us. I'm so excited about this discussion because university museums, they play such a distinct role within the arts ecosystem. But most of us really don't think about that fact, that idea of university art museums playing such a distinctive role. So, Mickey, starting with the Arizona State University Museum of Art, could you give us a little sense of your collections, your uh, your programs, your physical plant? And then we're going to do the same thing for Julie. And then we're going to come back around and talk about the unique uh, uh, operating attributes of the university museum as opposed to an independent museum. OK, and my pleasure. So ASU Art Museum is in a Antoine Predoc designed building. It is 40,000 square feet. Um, and then we have a ceramics research center and archive, which is an open storage classroom and residency. Uh, between the two facilities, we have about 45,000 square feet. We're based in Tempe, right on ASU's main campus. ASU has four different campuses, but we're uh, situated in Tempe, uh, right on the edge of campus near the theater. Tempe is also rapidly building. And we are part of Arizona State University, which is a public research university with 100,000 learners. Um, worldwide. And so our uh, footprint, even though it is um, very much um, about site, the, the building itself is really an ode to the desert. Um, we also think about all of our communities that can't reach us in Tempe. And Julie, uh, could you give us a, a sense of, of your physical footprint, your collections and so on? Yes. So the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive has been around for about 50 years. We were in a um, Mario Chompy designed brutalist structure for many years. And in 2016, moved to our current location, which is on the edge of campus in downtown Berkeley. We are um, in a building that was uh, originally part of it was originally the University of California printing press. And um, Diller Scafidio and Renfro, the architects, were hired to kind of retrofit an existing structure and add on to it. Um, and we reopened in 2016. We have about, I think, 80,000 square feet total and about 30,000 square feet of gallery space. The museum is not actually bigger than the old building. Um, a lot of people think it is. Um, we have three study centers on site, a works on paper study center, a film archive and library, and... Um, Oh, am I forgetting? Oh, the Cahill um, Chinese Painting Study Center. We have a collection of about 28,000 artworks and about 16,000 films and videos. So we have quite a large collection. And um, I'm planning to show more of the collection, which we can maybe talk about later. And in terms of our role, I mean, we are of UC Berkeley. We are part of UC Berkeley, you know, a major um, public research university. And um, we have um, maybe six or seven exhibitions on view, mostly modern and contemporary, but we also like to have trans-historical exhibitions that are sort of timely and relevant and connect the past and the present. Um, our staff is about 60 full-time and we employ hundreds of student employees as our gallery monitors and admission staff. Now you both operate within incredibly culturally rich environments, right? You have uh, all the different museums. You have the Phoenix Art Museum. You have the Heard Museum. Um, there are uh, the, there's the Musical Instrument Museum. All in that sort of Great Maricopa County uh, environment. Of course, Julie, you operate within the San Francisco Bay Area. You have the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco, the Oakland Art Museum, with and just a whole plethora of, of different institutions. How do you create a unique identity that connects to the university? but also establishes yourself as a uh, museum of merit within that incredibly rich environment. Mickey, how do, you, how do you do that? I think the one differentiator that really attracts even artists to come work with us is that um, artists and our public has access to the depth and breadth of Arizona State University vis-a-vis -vis our exhibitions. So, 
For example, our exhibitions, um, our curators are required to work with communities of practice, which are kind of a, a advisory council, but I would say more active than that, an accountability kind of network that is consists of students, scholars, and community experts. And so in the development of the exhibition and then throughout the programming um, and so forth, uh, we have a sense not just of a, a, a curatorial um, approach to the exhibitions, but a fully integrated approach um, to how the exhibitions um, are needed and reside within the needs of both of our community at large, as well as the student um, population. And so um, for our councils, our artists, they have access to scholars to, uh, you know, we have one of the largest center for meteorite studies. We have, you know, a, a Teotihuacan lab in Mexico City. We have so many um, opportunities for both our publics as well as our artists to take advantage of all of the learnings and scholarship that are happening at ASU that then sort of find their place in, in the galleries. You know, 70% of Arizonans don't have a college degree. They, they don't have access to all of the richness that's happening at ASU. So it's really through this museum vehicle that our communities are able to explore and take advantage of what's happening at, at um, this university. One of the things that really um, struck me was the, um, the idea of using the university as a, um, as a connector to uh, all sorts of issues, environmental issues, uh, ASU has a school of sustaining sustainability, um, which which we also worked for uh, previously. Um, you have uh, people like Gregory Sale, who uh, used to be on your board. I don't know uh, whether he still is, but he has always done very socially conscious about uh, art uh, related to incarceration and and those kinds of issues. Julie, um, do you have that same kind of connection into the various aspects of the university that are not normally associated with art, um, but have a, find expression in an artist's view of the world? Yes, I mean, I, I think we um, historically have very strong connections with faculty on campus, and I am increasingly interested in how we can find more ways to collaborate. I mean, on one hand, we um, our, our theater, our Osher Theater is a classroom space during the week. So we have any any professor can sign up to use our, our classroom. I mean, it's not even a classroom. It's a theater space. It's our film theater. Right. Mm -hmm. And the evening we show films five nights a week and we're renowned for our film program. But during the day, um, any class can come in and, and be taught in our space. And I think that's a very unique experience for students. But more than just, you know, the physical space that can be used for classroom teaching, um, we're looking for partnerships. We sometimes have um, classes that are taught generally in the humanities on Thursdays when we open, the public can drop into that class. So there's a porousness between what's being taught on campus and what the public has access to. I'm also creating a teaching gallery where faculty can just select works from our collection, put it on view for the semester, and that allows the public to see, oh, what is this class being taught at UC Berkeley? So let me challenge that, that idea because we work for a lot of museums, including university art museums, and this idea of the museum being a window, a porous window between the community and the university it very often um, finds expression more in its invalid state rather than its valid state. People talk about it, but it doesn't really happen. The people who actually come into museums are generally people from the university. Do you actually see whether there are people who are outside of the community who come into your institution? and, and uh, gain access to, uh, for example, Mickey, you said that 70% of Arizonans don't have college degrees. It, does the museum really function as that or, or is it more of an aspirational goal? Well, I will, I will challenge that <laughs> binary of um, town and gown only because Arizona State University is one of the most diverse uh, populations, that the student body. I mean, we graduate more first generation students than any other university in the country. We don't admit them, but we graduate more. We're really proud to say. But um, we, uh, our learners are um, 
not just 20, 19, 20 year olds. We have people who are working, who are doing low residencies, who are working nights and um, an incredibly diverse population that comes to ASU. We have four campuses throughout just the city and we have online campuses, uh, online courses across the globe. So our student body by design isn't um a town and gown kind of thing. We also so that's have- interesting. That's that's the idea of the art museum as part of a community that does not have walls between the university and others. Basically, what you're doing is, and Michael Crow has been a, a real visionary in this, dissolving those distinctions, those barriers, right. so that you can have people who are um, browsing. Um, and and being educated as they continue their professional uh, work in their other professions. And over time, they might uh, achieve a degree, but they also have the, these incredible experiences enabled right. by ASU. Well, in a place like Arizona, it's really important to have um, to, to to constantly uphold that the reason to have a state university to fund a state university um, is that it. We, re- we truly believe that the university um, uplifts all people in the community and that it is performing a social good by being an educator and a, and a source and a, a community resource. So well, the museum, exactly. So the museum perfectly aligns with that chart, that design um, thinking of what ASU is, is that we are something that is performing um, education edification, challenge, knowledge production for social good, for for community resilience and uh, community good. So, yes, we do have a lot of classrooms. We do consider ourselves a teaching university, um, a teaching instrument. However, we also think about ourselves as, you know, we are at the site of a a, a center that is constantly distributing knowledge via faculty, research, labs, but we all know that knowledge sometimes, like I always use this example of, I know sugar is bad for me, but I still eat it. Um, whereas, you know, what actually moves us is an experience, a story, uh, kind of a, something that can really touch us in, in a different kind of way. So in a lot of ways, we also think of ourselves as almost the heart center of all of this knowledge that is being produced, that's data, um, sort of data sets, the museum is this kind of vehicle that trans translates and transform knowledge into actual sort of experience that can move our so communities. I, so I love your challenge to the premise of my question. <laughs> you know, Berkeley has got this reputation. I mean, it's a, it's one of the jewels in the crown of, of, um, of, of the sort of the Cal system, right? Yes. Um, how do you function? You know, you have uh, Mickey talking about this idea of dissolving the walls between community um, and university experience and the professional experience. How do you see uh, you, your function within the institution? And do you serve as a window into the university? Yeah, I, th- I think we I think the physical move from the heart of campus to the border of campus in downtown Berkeley really signaled a shift in our role as a civic museum. So we are absolutely here to build community um, with with communities on campus, but also far beyond. And the I old think- building reminded me of the FBI building in in Washington D.C. It was big and it was brutalist, and it was it was mm-hmm. you, you, you had to go through these little passages to get to any place. It was oh my god, it was so intense. It was almost like a prison. Right. Well, <laughs> a lot of people are nostalgic for that building, I will say. Um, but I do think our the fact that we are a block away from public transportation now, right? There are a lot of things that allow us to be much more publicly accessible. And that's what we want to be, right? We want to be a hub for ideas um, that we are generating as an institution, right? We want to bring artwork, we want to bring films to the Berkeley community that maybe they don't have access to otherwise. And then also try to be the bridge between the community and and all of the brilliant thinking that's happening on campus by faculty and students, and also provide a service for, you know, all of the staff. Well, this is also a huge university. We have 45,000 students, you know, we have thousands of staff, um, all of whom have free admission. And so, 
what we're working on in some ways is telling our story better so people know that we're here for them. Um, and I think there's a sense that people expect to be challenged when they come to Berkeley Art Museum, Pacific Film Archive, um, challenged by ideas, challenged by artwork. Um, but also, I would say, first and foremost, we're working on building community and in some ways catching up with the conversations and questions that are happening on campus. I feel like we've got, got you know, become a little bit behind um, the, the deep questioning and thinking that's happening on campus by students and faculty. And we want to be, you know, the museum of UC Berkeley that absolutely reflects all of these kind of challenging questions. And, and similarly, you know, this is all to connect people for the social good, same. You know, we are here to, in many ways, I see our role as centering artists in the production of knowledge. And how do we share that? How do we make that accessible? How do we make our collections accessible? Um, and also to be a space of learning, not just for students, right? But for our staff, for the public to embody that space of learning and not knowing and questioning and discovering within a museum and exhibition space is something that I'm also very interested in. What um, kind of exhibitions and programs do you have uh, now, Julie, uh, staying with you and then moving on uh, to, to Mickey? What kind of, um, of exhibitions are you particularly proud of? at this point. Well, I'm thrilled that just a few weeks ago, we opened the first ever retrospective of Amalia Mesa Baines, who's a leading Chicana artist who's never had a retrospective, a longtime Bay Area artist whose works, um, you know, stem from a kind of ofrenda or even altar mode of making. And so we have 10,000 square feet of gallery space and her first ever monograph. Um, and to me, that is the work of shaping art history, right? I truly believe that the, the choices we make are, are impactful in what is studied in the future, what is known, what is visible um, now and into the future. And so I'm very, very proud of that. And we're working on a national tour for that exhibition. She's a MacArthur Genius Award-winning artist. You know, she's so deserving. And that is also building community. You know, when I had at our opening hundreds of people and they said, this feels like the mission in San Francisco, that was the highest, right? The highest sort of compliment I could have received is that people are starting to notice that what we are showing and what we're doing is starting to change what the community looks like at the museum. Are you defining art, uh, you know, and you, and you see it in the in the uh, ceramic center, right? Um, Three-dimensional art has very often been um, disrespected as being decorative or uh, less important than or whatever. But but what you're talking about is bringing other cultural traditions than uh, those that resulted in in um, in paintings, oil paintings on walls, right? Are you redefining through your work, Mickey, um, what uh, what culture is and what um, is is worthy of of exploration through your exhibitions? That's a great segue to the exhibition I was going to talk about that's on view now. But I will, if I might, if I may just respond to Julie's Amalia Mesa Baines exhibition. One of the things that university art museums can also do is do things more, um, uh, res in, in make uh, scholarship more responsive and adaptive than the academy can. So, for instance, with Latin American art, most of what students learn is through exhibition catalogs and not textbooks because there were no uh, PhDs or professors teaching Latin American art for so many years. It's the same with Chicano art. There is no PhD program that, you know, there are very, very few PhD scholars. So actually it was the space of the University Art Museum in many cases, GADA, for example, the seminal show for Chicano art. In many cases, it was the museums that could actually respond and make art history where the academy was slower. So I just want to say that's another. Well, that's interesting. Basically, you're able to pose questions that are not even posed and then create a challenge for response in the academy and in the community. And that's what you're doing, Julie, with your exhibition. That's what what you're talking about, Mickey, by th this idea that the catalogs themselves are begging a question and begging a response for the university, it becomes an in, a, 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 an, in, an incentive to address a gap, right? Right, and that's that's where the space of, 
you know, um, university art museums can play really important roles is that we can fill in the gaps where, you know, a, a much more entrenched system, which is the university um, a- academy system is still having to catch up with what's really needed in terms of scholarship and representation. So, but, and, and that's a good segue to the exhibition we have on view. We, we received a grant from the Terra Foundation um, which supports American art, we have an exhibition of our permanent collection that was curated by all of the curators, including our interns, fellows, and senior curators. So it's a multi-vocal, multi-perspectival approach to permanent collections. It's called Making Visible. And it's um, also, we worked with the community of practice. Among them is Miguel Luciano, the artist, um, Puerto Rican artist based in New York, who's worked with the Mets collections. Um, but we looked at the, the notion that um, libraries call them archival silences. And we thought about, we uh, have these permanent collections, we work with objects, and that is how we tell the stories that um, we put together through these objects. But what about the objects that couldn't have been made uh, because people were working or because taste didn't def- you know, allow them to enter a market? What about the things that, you know, were not um, gifted? Our collection is largely uh, donated by folks. So what are the tastes of the people that donate versus those that don't donate? Well, and the how taste do- makers are often people with the money to buy and their tastes dictate what gets produced, right? Or gets Which what then gets dictates what we have in our collections, which then dictates what we make what we make meaning of and what we make sense of. So uh, we we see in our collection, especially because in a place like Arizona, so many people move here and they have these romantic ideas of the West. And to so many people, we're El Norte, we're the North, or we're home for so many uh, people here. Uh, and yet these ideas continue to get perpetuated from one particular lens. So our curators took it upon themselves with their community of practice to really interrogate the notion of objects um, in our collection and the, the idea of re-presenting certain objects. And, and it also, um, that what they addressed was the idea that a Maria Martinez pot gets shown very differently than our Georgia O'Keeffe, <laughs> you know, made in similar regions and similar times, but always shown in very distinct ways. So what is it to um, have a permanent collection exhibition that disrupts these high art, craft, folk, non-MFA trained genres, which are all gatekeeping codes um, for what is in and what is out. So it's a really fantastic exhibition. It's part of a series of three permanent collection shows that the museum is taking on called um, Tierras Reimaginadas, Reimagined Territories. That's really thinking about the Southwest region as much more inclusive of the Americas and not solely defined by a U.S. border. So you're 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 both doing cultural storytelling. You're defining uh, what America is during this um, during this really interesting time where there's a real debate about what America is. I'm going to because we're coming to the end of our time. I'm going to I'm going to pose a final question. I'm going to give it to you, Mickey, and then Julie, you'll have the last word. What is America in cultural terms? What is America in cultural terms? Well, I usually you refer to the United States as the United States because America, in my view, is a much larger territory that expands far beyond uh, the borders of the United States. So that is one thing that is constantly on my mind, um, that we are part of the Americas. Um, uh, and so what that means to me is that it's our job to, um, you know, it's our job to follow artists and artists are interrogating constantly. They have, um, the, the kind of parameters of what, um, what we bump up against the inherited entrenched narratives that we, um, that that limit our thinking. And so artists kind of free us. They're kind of liberatory vehicles that free us from the limits of our our thinking and help us reimagine new 
new ways of being. So the museum follows artists who are also exploring what it means to be a citizen of the world, a citizen of this region, a, a citizen of this place. Um, and that may or may not have to do with the, the United States. It might be more global when we think about environmentalism and sustainability, when it when we think about history and migration, all kinds of things. So I my answer is everything. <laughs> so your your answer is also about challenging convention. Right, following the artists as the artist challenge convention. Uh, Julie, what is your answer uh, for what what the what America is? Because if your institution is describing what America is and what um, uh, the, the ideas of artists, you may you're making choices about what is described. Right, your curators are making choices, so you're. Providing a service that allows me as a visitor to explore these mm -hmm. visions. How do you make those decisions? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would not, I would maybe reframe our work as being about the United States. I mean, I think we are of a region, we are within a region that has very specific histories, right? Berkeley, the Bay Area, adjacent to Oakland. Um, and so for me, I really think about how are we serving these communities and what is relevant to our local communities? Um, but also, I mean, if we are thinking about the state of culture in the country right now, I think we are shifting narratives around histories and power dynamics and identities through art exhibitions, as like you said, um, by following artists. But we are a, an institution that is dedicated to telling stories of the global diasporas. And I would say that is kind of this, the notion of migration and movement is not new. <laughs> it is very much part of our histories um, and our communities. And so how we can um, make space for experiences, historically marginalized um, experiences and stories in, within our exhibition programs and our collections to connect people, right, across our differences, but also to make sure that people are seeing themselves in our museum spaces too. It's a, it's a confluence of all of those. And I also want to maybe um, mention something um, that, you know, Mickey was talking about, which is I think academic art museums can also be key in becoming spaces of um, self-criticality and not being afraid, right? I think a lot of bigger museums have played it safe for a variety of reasons, um, from funding to you know community backlash, whatever. But I really think we can be the space that is critical of the institution of the museum and talk about that, make that publicly visible. Um, and I, I applaud, you know, the kind of initiatives that um, bring those questions into exhibition making. I think that's really key. And not having all the answers, right? Not having the author authoritative stance that museums have had for so long, but actually bringing us uh, the, the position of questioning rather than telling <laughs> and informing um, and learning together, I think is one of the most exciting thing that academic art museums can do right now. I love that. Uh, th this idea, which you both expressed, of not packaging up conclusions, but instead fostering dialogue, not uh, coming out with some sort of set storyline, but looking at alternative storylines, um, inviting people in to have an opinion, uh, inviting artists to have a point of view, Right. And and then let's sort of mix it up. That's what you're talking about. Each of you. Thank you so much. Mickey Garcia, director of Arizona State University Museum of Art. Billy Rodriguez Widholm, executive director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. This has been just a great discussion and a, and a great exposure to each of your institutions and the important role, the very important role of university art museums, the museum ecosystem. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.